You don't want to get it out. For those of you who might be joining us on Stride, we're taking a couple minutes to just get things set up here. And everything you see on the screen, unfortunately, will be backwards, but hopefully, you still get. Um, the main points that we're talking about. So not exactly that kind of kick. Yeah, yeah. Maybe kind of where Matt would turn to look a bit more. No. What? This is why you and I just stayed there. I need to say that uh, tonight's meeting is being held in compliance with the Nebraska Open Meetings Act, a copy of which is posted in our boardroom. And uh, I think it's appropriate that we all say the Pledge of Allegiance as well. So stand up and uh, let's do that. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thanks everybody for coming tonight to our uh, board community engagement session. Um, I think I know almost everybody out there. If I don't know you, uh, my name is Matt O'Daniel. I uh, have served on the board for about, I'm going to say, 10 years. Um, currently serving as the president right now. And uh, to my right is Dr. Don Lewis, our superintendent. Um, before we move forward, I do want to introduce the rest of the board members this evening. Um, I'll start with our two new board members, Cassie Flesner. Cassie, do you want to? You're good? Okay. <laughs> Brian Locker, where's Brian at? There's Brian. Brian. Brian and Cassie were just elected in the election in November, so we're 
we're happy to have them. Um, we've got Chase Craddleville. Where's Chase? Chase, thank you. Shannon, Shannon Wilmot in the back there. Everybody knows Shannon and Jason Arp. Jason, you want to tell us anything about you? You're good too? Okay, excellent. Um, and I'll let Dawn introduce the rest of the admin staff. I'm sure everybody knows them here in a minute. But uh, just a little bit about how, how we arrived here tonight. Um, so one of our goals as a board is to have more engagement with the community, to have better lines of communication so that the community knows um, what's happening up here at the school. And uh, everybody on the board works really hard and I think we've got a wonderful school system up here. The admin team and the teachers, everybody works very, very hard. And of course we wanna share that as well. So I'm not gonna steal any of your thunder, but we did send a survey out and our presentation tonight is based on the results of that survey. So I'm gonna go ahead and give the mic to Dr. Lewis. She can tell us about that survey, introduce some others and we'll get started. So we'll go ahead and begin by introducing the admin team. Um, we have one member who is not here with us this evening, but um, our secondary principal, uh, Mr. Aaron Kingston. Our elementary principal and SPED director, Mrs. Jackie Morgan. And our assistant high school principal, 7 through 12 principal and activities director, James Shada. And then our curriculum director slash assessment coordinator is Tasha Wolf. And I did not see her there this evening. Um, I know she had basketball practice and then she was probably headed out after that. So those are the members of the team that helped with portions of this uh, presentation that you're going to see this evening. And then again, like Matt said, we surveyed um, the community. Yeah, we had pretty good response. We were happy um, with 114 responses. That's a pretty high rate of return. I told Mrs. Morgan today, who's busy working on her dissertation, if you were conducting a survey um, for a research project, that would be uh, clinically significant and you could use those findings. So we're going to use those findings tonight. So of the people that completed the survey, um, we gave you, pick your top three topics, right? So we took um, the combination of the percentage where they kind of popped in. So collectively, 62% 62, 62 of people selected budget as either their first, second, or third choice. 56% um, of people chose curriculum as first, second, or third, and then 54% of people chose enrollment trends. And the rest of them were kind of trailing far behind, but if you have questions about those, we'll have some time for that at the end. Um, so if something doesn't get answered that you really wanted um, to know this evening, uh, we'll save that for the end. Mr. Fingston is also my technical director. If I can interrupt for just a second, too, we've got cards on all the tables. We're going to have questions at the end. So as we're going through this, if you have questions, write them down on the cards and we'll get to them. Um, we thought it would be better to do that than to have questions throughout. We may have to get that into so. And Mr. Shader will appreciate this because I just spent uh, about 20 seconds giving the exact amount of index cards to make that perfectly level up there, and then Mr. Fingston moved it. And now my inherent need for symmetry is thrown a little off, so hopefully it doesn't throw off the rest of the presentation. So the first part of our presentation, and um, tell me where you want me to stand so we can see everything up there, but I also kind of need to run the computer, so I'll kind of move and get out of the way as we go, um, was topic. Uh, the first topic was budget. So we will begin at the beginning there. So our budget process, um, sometimes it seems like maybe on board meetings, we're not talking about this um, specifically um, every single meeting, but I will tell you some of the things that go into it that to me are the beginning of our budget process. So in November, we begin um, our process of negotiations with the certificated teaching staff. So what that looks like is um, the AEA coordinating with the Board of Education, finding times to meet. Um, we pull arrays of, of salary and benefit schedules and things like that from our area schools. And they come together collectively three or four times. Um, sometimes it's less than that, sometimes it's more than that, to come to an agreement on what um, the base salary and the benefits package and all of those things, uh, leave times, things like that, that are all negotiated with the board will be. So that's kind of the beginning of my budget process. As we start working through that, um, I'm projecting um, what those costs are going to be for us next year uh, with every different offer that's on the table. So when we come to a settlement, that's the first number um, that goes into um, the big budget spreadsheet that I keep. So that's where we begin. 
we begin um, with negotiations. And like I said, typically we have to begin well before the 1st of November, but usually we're done sometime in December. Um, we hit a little technical snag this year, so they did wrap up and they will vote on their agreement in February. So if you want to know more about that, that will be coming up. Um, but so that starts in December. So that's really where, well, actually uh, insurance comes in before that. So budget comes in slightly, um, slightly in November too. I was thinking to myself, I give myself November off and I don't think about the budget in November. I just worry about the audit, but that's not true because um, our insurance increase numbers come in in November. So I start plugging those in as well. So we begin in December with that process. Um, once we're finished with the certificated staff, which is all of the teaching staff that hold teaching certificates, so if I say certificate, certificated, that is what I mean. Then we roll into the next group of, of um, staff members that um, have salary increases that are negotiated as well with the board, and those include the administrators, it includes the classified staff, which is um, the paras and the custodians and the cooks and the bus drivers. Um, so all of those start rolling in. Usually we're um, approving increases for all of those around March, usually not later than April. Sometimes we go into April, but um, typically it's between March and April. So those numbers start dropping in to the budget. Um, we start looking at our pre-approval of building level budgets. And when I say that, that's a process where the teachers get blank requisition forms and they start filling out kind of their wish lists. Those get turned in, um, they get passed out at the beginning of February, turned in by the end of February. Um, the building level principals go through those budgets, um, kind of look over things, what they think um, is acceptable and what things are necessary and required and what things that we can do without. And they bring them to me and we have a meeting with the board finance committee on those. We take a look at those um, and kind of determine what we're going to need as far as costs for supplies and things like that go. Um, for the coming year, and you usually see those approved um, on the board meeting in April, so then those go into the budget. Um, Buildings and Grounds Committee begins meeting. We take a look at the things that we need to do over the summer, that kind of work. Um, we take a look at kind of more long-term things. We have a big a Google Doc that we work off that we drop things off of and we add things onto. Some things are on a two-year list, some things are on a three, some things are on a five-year list. So. We keep kind of an ongoing work list of those things. Um, some of them, if they're small ticket items and they're under a $10,000 fix, those don't require specific board approval. Um, anything greater than that, we, uh, we go before the board with approval. Typically, we try and get as many estimates as we can for anything that's over $10,000. Um, but sometimes you, uh, yeah, you struggle, especially kind of in this economy right now and getting multiple bids, but we do our best. Um, so we try and get the lowest cost on some of those projects that cost over $10,000. If a project is over $109,000 is a new policy number, that is when you have to go out for competitive bids, you have to advertise, you have to have 30 days, you have to have made every effort to get at least three bids and then the board has to approve the lowest responsible bids. So we have policy limitations on those amounts. Um, so then we kind of take a look at what the cost of fuel has done, what the cost of our um, overhead, our electricity, our water, those things have looked like over the year and kind of try and project um, what we can expect those costs to increase over the year. So all those things are in the budget and on the document that I work from before May or typically around May. Then in June, the auditor of the public, uh, uh, the auditor of public accounts releases the document that uh, schools and all public municipalities entities are required to fill out and submit. So once that uh, becomes available to us, I go in and I start putting our information into that. All of this um, we are doing without knowing what our actual valuation is going to be yet. Um, so we get all that done in uh, June and July. We meet with the finance committee throughout this process multiple times. So when we do the building level budgets, when we do buildings and grounds, we do all of these negotiations and things like that. Those are all on board committees and then they come to the board for action. In July, we have a couple of separate then finance committees. Um, I call the counties, I try and get an estimate of what we think our valuations are going to be. I project out what our budget looks like if valuations stay the same, if they increase by two, if they increase by four. And then on August 20th, when we finally get our actual valuations, and this is when we can sit down and have another committee meeting and talk about what the levy is actually going to look like. 
prior to the August board meeting, we hold a full board um, budget workshop. So that typically happens about, if, a, if the meeting starts at 7, we begin that at 6.15. We go through all of the components that are in the big budget, uh, make sure everyone is aware of where, uh, where all of our, Mr. Finkston's adjusting our stride. If you're having trouble with stride, let Mr. Finkston know um, if you're watching at home and he will try and adjust it for you. But it is backwards, I did try and mention that before. So anyway, so we go through that before the August board meeting. Um, September, the board meeting um, includes the hearings, the, uh, the budget hearing and the levy request hearing. Um, those are published two weeks before the board meeting, so everybody has a chance to read those in the paper. And then depending on um, what the legal requirements are, we may have to attend a joint agency meeting, which was brand new last year. I think there, there's some legislation that's trying to kind of clean up and make it clearer who needs to attend and what those, what those meetings need to look like for next year. Um, so then our budget typically is going for approval by the board in September. The budget itself is due to the Auditor of Public Accounts and to the state by September 30th, and our levy request is due on October 15th. So you can see that's kind of a year-long process. Um, I'm sorry, that was kind of a lot, but it's it's not it's not a quick not a quick easy thing. Thank you. Yeah, you can go back to that last slide real quick. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I just want to add that you know a lot of us here have, have run small businesses or businesses, and the uh, you know so when we do that and we do annual budgeting, right? We look at revenue and we look at expenses and and we put our budgets together to run our businesses or our households or whatever. It takes a long time to get your brain around school budgeting. And there are a lot of moving parts. I know ever since I've been on the board, we've always focused on the expense side of things because that's really the only one that we can control on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and I think we're doing a good job at that. Um, and then as we'll see in a couple slides forward, there's a lot of different revenue sources other than property taxes, which is the big hot button. Um, you know, and, and we utilize those as well. I just, I can't emphasize how many moving parts there are there. There's some activity going on down in Lincoln that may influence this in the future. Um, but I can tell you, you know, in, in working with Don for three years, three budgets, fourth budget, fourth budget year, um, she does a really, really good job with it. She's very knowledgeable about it and knows her way through the budget process. And, and we're fortunate for that because it's, it's a year-round job, um, but we're on it, so I'll let you proceed. All right, and I know that took a little bit of time, so I'll try and go a little bit more quickly through some of these because we have a lot of important stuff that's not all connected to finance to talk with you about. This is going to be really hard to see, so if anybody wants a copy of this, um, request one from me and I will email that to you. Um, but this is just kind of a... It's not kind of, it is a a year-to-year -year comparison of the different budget areas that we code um, from 1920 all the way through the 22-23 budget. Those are um, my four budgets. Um, the first one was primarily done um, when I got here, but I got in on the, uh, the July part of it and everything like that. So a lot of the decisions that had been made were already done before I began. But that was my first budget, and then you can kind of see the areas where we've grown, the areas where we've kind of uh, tried to leverage to, to offset some of the increases in other ones. But the first two, it's hard to kind of see, but it's regular instruction and poverty and all of our activities. And then the second one is SPED. So if you look at those, um, those comprise, uh, let's see, looks like about 68 million of our budget. So um, that's where the majority of our salaries are paid. So um, the majority of not just, not just our teachers, but um, our repairs and um, uh, all of our SPED staff and everything like that are in those two codes. So you can see that those have increased the most um, over the past four years. And when we're talking about salaries, we're not just talking about the dollars that they're seeing on their paychecks. We have to also include the cost of benefits. We include the cost of insurance, FICA, our share of the retirement, things like that. So the codes that have increased primarily 
are due to salaries, but we've also experienced some of the same increases that you have over the past year or two, which would be the increased cost of fuel. Now in transportation, we did uh, kind of stabilize where we are with our fleet, so we haven't been levying for the actual purchase of a bus. We did set aside money in depreciation for the purchase of a bus, so that's not something that we had to ask for and levy this year. So you can see our transportation, which is down here. Cost went down um, a little bit, even though the cost of fuel and everything went up because we did cut out that cost of levying for a vehicle purchase. We still levied in there for a small vehicle purchase to replace um, vans as they start uh, getting worn out through wear and tear as well, but we didn't purchase, we didn't levy for a large vehicle this year. So that's where some of that came from. There's a few that are offsetting. There's a couple that, like the curriculum, um, what would be like the curriculum and instruction kind of budget that went up a little bit because we moved some things out of like library and distance technology and things like that out of that. Um, for a couple of years, we were able to drop a lot out of our admin technology, which is where we purchase all of our computers because we, over the past two years, we haven't had to purchase a single computer for students because we had um, E-rate, what they called emergency connectivity funds in there. So um, this year we did have to levy to purchase computers again because that money has uh, dried up. So that went up a little bit. We also went from um, a tech staff who was three days a week to a full-time person, which we really needed. So the costs in that um, are up a little bit. You can see where we've made the greatest cuts is in buildings and grounds. So we managed to cut almost half a million dollars out of that budget over four years. So that's kind of been the pivot point. Um, we haven't been levying in there to complete any capital projects because we had things going on in the special building fund, which is where um, we completed the uh, addition. So in the 2022-2023 budget, 82% um, of the funds are actually for staff salaries, benefit costs, insurance, retirement, FICA, all of that that I talked about. Um, the remaining 18% um, roughly is uh, for, for everything else. That includes all of our textbooks, all of our supplies, the overhead, um, yeah, transportation that's not connected to salaries, um, anything else that falls into any other code. So I'm gonna let Matt talk about why that's important to the board for just a second before we go on. Yeah, sure. It's, you know, this number gets thrown around a lot. Uh, 80 plus percent of our budget goes to people. And, you know, the duh statement here, right, is it, is it takes people, it takes good people to educate kids. And, um, you know, I just, I believe in investing in people. And I think the board has always recognized the fact that we need to have good people up here in front of our children when they're trying to learn. We know we have a good product. They come out, they're well prepared. And, and that's why, um, <clears throat> You know, the other thing to think about when that much of our budget is going back to the people, that's going to people that mostly live in the community, spend their money in the community, um, they have homes here. You know, um, this school is a really, really important part of Arlington's community. I believe it's as goes the school district goes our community and, um, you know, good people need to be compensated. And, and we have all kinds of studies that say that everybody's compensated fair in a raise and things like that. Um, but it's really, at the end of the day, it comes down to what's best for the kids and, and having good people in front of our kids is, there's no substitute for that. This next slide is just kind of a comparison of where our levy has been, and we've gone over this a couple of times at board meetings and on our levy hearings that we had this year, but you can kind of look over the past, oh, I think I've got about 14 years of levies on there. So you can see the years um, when equalization aid was really starting to fade out for our district. Um, uh, levies around 2010 all the way till about 2015 were um, $1.14 total, $1.13 total, right in there. Um, a mechanism that the state gave us was to um, to offset state aid was to try and recoup some of that money um, and some option funding so they were able to do that. It looks like around 2016 or so, again before my time, but I'm sure that um, those of you who can remember that could attest to that. That's when the option number started going up a little bit, but it did make a difference in the levy. Um, you can see that there. And then I thought it was important to compare Arlington's levy and valuations and other state funding that we receive to uh, some of the communities that you may also pay taxes in, because I know some of you are on the edge of our of our district, and so you might have land in Blair, you might have land in uh, 
Omaha that sits in Douglas County or in Bennington and some of those. So I just thought it was interesting to put some of the levies up there. And if you compare dollar for dollar, if we look at Arlington, this year we're at a dollar four nine. Um, our valuation is 770 million. We only get $80,000, roughly a little more than that, of state equalization aid. And then our total aid, um, which includes all of our state receipts, which would be option, net option funding, um, state equalization aid, and allocated income tax receipts, and then a couple of other little ones that amount to a couple thousand dollars. Um, so our total money from the state um, comes to just about $1.2 million. You can take a look at what some of our neighbors have. Blair is at a dollar nine. Their valuation is about three times as high as ours, but their total state resources are significantly lower even than ours because they do not have net option funding. So they get zero equalization aid and they don't get any net option funding. So that coming for, for them is primarily their allocated income tax refunds. Um, Fremont, you see um, where they're at, their valuation is about four times ours. They get quite a bit more state aid. They're in a different position with their community and their, their, their tax base. Um, Fort Calhoun, about the same size as we are, at $1.23, but you see their valuation is lower. Um, they get about $1.3 million in equalization aid and their total state resources are about $4 million. So they, they get about $2.5 million of, equal, of net option funding. Um, it's not quite a third of their students, about 28, 29% of their students are option, I believe. Omaha, whole different beast. Not even going to talk about that, really. Elkhorn as well. Bennington, I know, is super close to some of you. Um, that levy is higher. Their valuation is about three times as high. Um, they get a lot more equalization aid than we do, and their total state resources are about $20 million. And then Logan View, interestingly, you can take a look at that, and their levy is quite a bit lower than ours, but their valuation is about, it's just shy of $200 million higher than ours. So, um, And again, they're getting no equalization aid, but they do have some net option funding that brings them to $836,000, um, but they're generating just under about $200,000, a little less than that, um, less than we are with their levy because their valuation is quite a bit higher. So sometimes it's important to just look at all of those pieces that go in there when you're, when you're seeing what a levy does and what valuations, how they impact that. Anybody want to see, anybody want to see, I'll just show you real quick because I'm not going to dwell on it. Um, so the formula that we use to, hang on, sorry, it did. Okay, the formula that we use to come up with all of these is given to us by the state um, in their wisdom. Now I have to find it here. All right. So this is the Tax Equity and Op Educational Opportunity Support Act, which gives us the formula that tells us what our yield from local effort rate and all of the things that are our resources that they say we have to tap into and why they, how they determine um, what our state aid, what our equalization aid is going to be. So the first section talks here about um, what the actual formula needs look like. So here are all the pieces that are going in, into our, our resources and then how they adjust it. So it's basic funding, poverty allowances, all these allowances that go into it. They count your formula students if you're under like 900 and some formula students. Um, they don't go, they don't really look at you on a per pupil basis. If you're over 900, they look at you on a per pupil basis. So they adjust your funding that way a little bit. All of these are the allowances that are taken into consideration. And then, um, so those are the sum of your yield from local effort rate plus all of those. And then your net option funding, which if you have more option students coming in than going out, you're guaranteed um, a specific amount that this year, this that amount was ten thousand six hundred twenty-five dollars per student. Um, it varies though. It's a it's a it's a moving target based on the actual per pupil average um, across the state and some other things that go into that. Only a bunch of politicians could come up with this formula. Yeah. And uh, there it is. Think of it as practical. It's it's nearly impossible to understand. And what's interesting is it's kind of set up so that they only have to change tiny little pieces of it to 
direct more money some directions in other directions. So you will see uh, with consistency that I think there's maybe 80 some student or schools in the state. There's 249 districts in the state. I think it's 80 or less that actually receive any equalization aid or not. Um, Arlington hasn't for several years. We moved back into equalization this year um, to $81,000. So anyway, just so you know, um, just so you get a little look into a day in the life of a superintendent, I thought I would pop that up and kind of show that to you. I'll get, I will get us right back to where we were. Okay, so that's the document that we kind of live, eat, and breathe for a while, and the legislators play with, and we enjoy that. But so. What you kind of need to keep in mind, and you all have a connection to um, senator for for your area or for your district, but there's two different proposals uh, this year in the legislature, which could potentially help. They're both um, proposals that would get um, more money back to schools, um, to a lot of them. The governor has a proposal that um, would send uh, what they call uh, foundation aid, $1,500 per student to every school district based on how many students they have. Um, and that would be in an effort to lower um, your yield from local effort, right? They would kind of do that and say, okay, you've got this, so we can take that off of there and you would tax less um, for that or it would ease that burden on the taxes. There's other pieces to that too, but that's a, the primary one that's in there. Um, the governor's plan essentially lowers everybody's levy across the state by about 10 cents by doing that is, is kind of what it'll look like. Um, there's another one that's been referred to as the Nebraska plan. That um, So the governor's plan is in three different LBs and I didn't put them on there. So there's three different bills that kind of work in tandem that would have to work together for that to all fall into place. And then there's one called the Nebraska plan. That's LB 322, I believe, or 320. And um, that one is, uh, the effort in that one is to um, lower the reliance on ag properties in your district by, um, in the formula where it talks about your yield from local effort rate. Um, right now, the, the, the number that they base ag land on is um, 76. And it was, this would drop that down to 46, 42. I'm, I'm getting it wrong in my head. And then, yeah, yeah. percent. So. Um, so it would allow you to um, expect less against your ag land and then it would lower your real property which is all of our homes and things that are not classified as ag land from 96 cents to 86 I'm sorry 96 percent to 86 percent so that's how that one works and what that does is actually um, works to bring everybody's levies across the state just a little bit closer to each other so rather than just dropping everybody 10 cents um, this one, it works just a little bit, a little bit different way to try and get everyone's levies a little closer to each other. So across the state, there's schools that levy as low as 45 cents, and there's schools that levy at a dollar 45, which we've seen up here today. So that one is an effort to kind of bring everybody a little bit closer. Clearly, they're not going to get everyone, even across the board, but trying to um, really create some equity for all property owners across the state. So, if you feel like you would like to visit with our senator, who's um, Senator Van Hansen or Blair. Um, we've also got some well-connected people in the audience here today who might. Uh, Mr. Dwyer is sitting out here, and I know he's got some political connections, so if you want to talk with him about either of those um, plans, I'm sure he could fill you in a little bit, too. So there's hope. There's there's hope every year. This year, there's two pieces of hope. So we're really hopeful that we have a governor who is committed to getting um, more funding to the schools in Nebraska, and that's a, a good message to be hearing from, from Lincoln. So. And then lastly, just a quick slide on what we have left in our bond payments. So these are all contained in special funds. This is not general fund. So we have three payments that we're making right now. We have the Qualified Capital Purpose Undertaking Fund, which we, uh, we refer to as QCPUF. So we've just made a payment on that in December. We have two more payments to be made. So next December and the one after that. Um, so we'll have to levy one more year for that payment. And then we should have enough in reserves to pay off the final payment. Um, the series 2012 bond, which has been refunded twice now for a lower interest rate, and we knocked, some, we knocked a payment off last time we refunded it too. So we have nine payments left on that. We also pay that one in December um, with an additional interest payment in June. We refinanced that um, just last winter. 
it's only been a whole year ago already, my goodness. Um, the re remaining balance on that is just a little over $5 million, and the interest rate is now averaging the coupons vary a little bit over the years, but they average out at 1.118%. And then our lease purchase payment, which is for the addition. Um, we have three more payments after we make this one next month. Um, currently, there's enough in reserves to manage at least uh, two of those three payments, and we're considering um, maybe um, escalating that in the future. Probably not this year, but we just kind of want to make sure that we're in a comfortable position cash flow wise and we don't deplete all of our reserves in there. So those are made out of the special building fund. We make a lease payment to the leasing corporation. So, and then uh, we have 1.119787. So just over $1 million left on the balance of that after we make the payment next month. And the interest rate on that averages out at 1.5%. So pretty good interest rate. If I could just add here, because everybody asks me this all the time, anytime we talk about this QC Puff Bond, what in the heck is a QC Puff Bond? Um, we did this in my time on the board to replace the HVAC systems in the building. We had chillers and boilers in there. Um, now we have rooftop units. I think, I'm going to get this wrong, but I think that uh, initially was around $3 million. So we've been knocking that down pretty good, but that's what it's for. Obviously, the 2012 bond was for an expansion and then the lease purchase was for the expansion that we just did. Yeah, and there's, there's, did you say there's a lot of limitations on what you can do at a QC puff? It used to be, it used to be air quality control, which is what it was done for when we did the HVAC units. Now you can only use that for like accessibility for ADA compliance and things like that. So the, I think the, the year that it was done, they maybe had two more years that they could have used it for air quality when they did that here. Okay, we're done with budget. We'll talk about some fun stuff now. Um, we've got curriculum um, is the next uh, highest um, percentage of the people's interest there. So as we're going through this, I want to point out that we have a couple tables over here. We have samples of our curriculums that we're going to be talking about. Um, so if when we take that break, if you want to get up or if you haven't done it already, you can go ahead and you can pick up those different uh, curriculum we use. You can examine them. You can kind of read through some of the lessons um, just so you have a good sense of what we're using with our kids. Okay, so we have a couple of policies that uh, dictate how we how we move through a curriculum cycle, and this is probably a good time for me to call on the principals to, to help with some of this. So the first one, policy 6121, is our curriculum review cycle. So we've got four core areas that we look at. We have reading language arts, we have math, we have science, and we have social studies, and we try and offset those so we're not doing those in back-to-back -back years. And in between those, we have fine arts, and then we have CTE, and principles, what is the, the third one that we do? PE. That was with fine arts, though, wasn't it? So Anyway, I didn't think I attached that one, so I can't pull that one up. But if you're really interested, I will email you a copy of that or you can access on our website. But it's a three-year cycle to just adopt a curriculum. So this year, for example, we're in research year of our math curriculum. We're in implementation year of, no, we're in, of our, no, we're in research of CTE. We're in, <laughs> this is where it gets confusing. I have to have the document in front of me. So basically, your first year of selection of anything is research, and then you select samples that you want to pilot, and we go through those. We're not piloting yet. So we're in research of math. Next year, we will pilot. The year after that, we will choose the one that they want to purchase and implement. This year, we are in CTE selection. So we were in research last year for, for I'm sorry, career and tech education. So anyway, all of these different areas go through this. We do this in seven-year cycles. That's why there's seven different areas that we look at because the state and their infinite wisdom, they review all of the standards every seven years and they tell us what has changed and what we now need to align to. Um, the process of aligning the curriculum doesn't necessarily mean that you have to purchase new curriculum. There's been times when we've gotten the new standards and we've looked at the curriculum that we have and we're like, this is good and it's actually better than some of the other curriculum that are out there. However, curriculum companies have realized that this is happening and so they now design their curriculum with online access packages and things like that. They'll sell this to you for seven years of access because they know that our state 
redoes everything every seven years. So whether you need new curriculum or not, after seven years, you might still have your textbooks, but you lose your access to all of the pieces that they need to teach and all of the reproducibles that the students use and all of the online components and things like that. So you pretty much have to purchase new curriculum now in all those areas after seven years anyway. And then we have our academic content standard um, policy, which is 6212. Um, Arlington schools basically have stated in policy that whatever the state says we need for English language arts, math, science, and social studies, um, unless there's something we sincerely object to, and the people of Nebraska have spoken about the things that they sincerely object to and has caused the State Board of Education to actually pause and go back. But so far, in those four subject areas, things have been rather innocuous. So there haven't been an awful lot of, um, coming at least from the state, um, things that we haven't been uh, comfortable aligning to. So those are the ones that we typically do. They, they tell us that we have to do those pretty much anyway. Um, they give us two years from the time they release the standards to adopt them. And then the other standards generated in non-core areas, they do PE standards, they do, um, health standards, they do career tech ed standards, they do music and other fine arts standards, they do all of those. You don't have to adopt those. The state says you can adopt your own as long as they're at least as rigorous or more so than what the state gives us to choose from. Okay, so currently used curriculum. These are the ones that are available for you to review. Um, are our, we've got reading out here um, and language arts, which we just adopted last year. The K2 is in Super Kids. And then three through, five, three through five is in my view, and six through 12 is in my perspective. So that's the Pearson product. So pretty much grades three through 12 are all in a consistent uh, curriculum there. Um, K through two, that super kids curriculum reminds me of Watts of the way I learned um, to read when I was in kindergarten and first and second grade. So if you know anything about education and curriculum, the pendulum swings back um, back and forth. And, and some, you know, 10 years from now, it might go back to super direct instruction. Now it's kind of, kind of in this uh, little bit of whole language and the kids have a lot of fun um, learning with that curriculum that we, that we select for them that the teachers really selected for them last year and the board voted to purchase for them. Um, K through two science are in McGraw-Hill curriculum, three through six science are in Pearson, seven through eight science they're in Amplify. That's uh, more of a kind of a web-based online, lots of um, online labs and things like that. It was a little bit more expensive to purchase up front, but then the ongoing costs of uh, purchasing lab materials and things like that are a little bit less. Um, we've been in that for a couple of years, and kids seem to like that. 9 through 12 science, we have a combination of McGraw-Hill and Pearson. 7 through 12 social studies, we have Hooten Mifflin Harcourt is HMH, except for 11th grade, which uses Pearson. And then math, we're currently in review year. Like I said, what we're looking at is Envisions, which we have Envisions over there, the one that we're currently in. Um, we're in 2.0, and we're looking at the next bit of that version. Um, we're really comfortable with that one, and you can see from our data that our math scores are really, really phenomenal this year. We're super proud of our students for doing that well. So if we can stay in that, we'd like to, but we're also looking at one called Bridges, one called Eureka Squared, um, another Hooten Mifflin Harcourt uh, curriculum, and then one called Big Ideas. So we're gonna narrow that down this year. Um, to, to narrow these down, where we look, we go to Ed Reports, which is a website that gives uh, schools and uh, curriculum directors the opportunity to, um, and experts, to align to state standards. It tells us this one is well aligned to Nebraska state standards, but it's weak in fluency or it's weak in um, phonemic awareness or things like that. So it, it gives us a really good insight into what the strengths and the weaknesses are going to be in the curriculum and if they're aligned or not. And uh, that's how we narrow our choices. And then the teachers get to really kind of dive into them. You guys want to say anything else about that? Okay, the next question came about our career. Um, one of the comments that came with the question about curriculum, I should say, was about um, career and technical education courses that we have here in uh, Arlington. So 
Um, I am going to ask Mr. Pinkston to come up and speak about those a little bit. What I have up here is a listing of the courses that we offer, but that doesn't really tell you exactly what's happening in our classrooms. And you can read through those, but we do have a significant amount of offerings for our students to take. In the areas of career tech ed, we also have um, activities that support our career and tech education classes, and those um, really are FFA, FBLA, and Skills USA. So I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Pinkston and Mr. Shada to kind of talk about some of those things a little bit. Are you prepared? Okay. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, so, just make sure you get acronyms right with the uh, with what we're talking about. Career and techni technical education um, is CTE, um, is your um, ag, industrial tech, fine arts, um, your um, FCS, family consumer science, which some of you may know it as homemaking, or I don't know how far back it goes. Um, Here's what you need to hear from me probably, is that through our counseling office, in addition to talking with students about what their interests are and getting interest inventories from them and an idea of what they want to do for a career, we want and we take pride in exposing them to a lot of different opportunities to at least get their feet wet with a variety of curricular choices. All right, so if you go into our FCS Family Consumer Science, you'll see a lot of foods classes and then you'll see a lot of education classes. All right, you will see fewer and fewer of your um, like sewing and different things like that. All right, the reason and rationale behind that is because we have a lot more kids going uh, on with their education in the post-secondary plans in education than we do with being a tailor and different things like that. Not that those things aren't important and not that we don't teach uh, basic skills that way. It's that we want our offerings to mirror as close as possible, knowing that we have a lot of restrictions and a lot of limitations, what our students are able to at least be exposed to at the high school level. All right, so in addition to that, then we communicate and we have a partnership, especially with Metro Community College, and um, that really has developed really strong over the past, we'll say, three, four years to where we are able to provide different offerings for students via concurrent enrollment, where we have a teacher at the school who is college certified and high school certified. So a student gets credit for both a Metro class and the high school class. Or now what Metro has is, sorry, I try to get out here a little further. <clears throat> or what Metro now has is, is a lot of different offerings where they provide the teacher and the student gets high school credit and Metro credit. So that helps us on the budget side of things and all of that because we're not hiring that teacher. Now we're trusting Metro to have those teachers available, but we are on the same side still offering those opportunities for our kids to get high school credit as well as the Metro credit. Um, yeah, so if you get this presentation in the back, can you see these numbers or not? Okay, so ultimately what one of the slides is, is um, how our student, like how it's been distributed over the past three years with how many students are taking advantage of that opportunity. So from 2019 is 52 to last year is 72 students total number who are getting at least some sort of metro combination credit with us. And then what you see is different distribution of hours to where like this column that says NA for you in the back, that is 2019-2020 kickstart classes, which is where metro provides the teacher and the kids get high school and college credit to where now we have 648 credit hours from last year where students have that opportunity. <clears throat> what that does for us and what that does for kids is, well, quite a few things. It scares the garbage out of me because they've got to do well in those classes. 
Like not doing well in those classes hurts you with your college GPA as well as your high school GPA and earning credits towards for us and earning credits towards your college graduation. We have great families, we have great kids, and what we see is that we have kids who leave here with a lot of credits toward their associate's degree or building toward their four-year degree because they've been able to take these classes. It does one of two things. If you are the type of student who wants to speed through college, you're way further down the road. But what we've also seen, because I'm a parent with two college-age kids. Uh, I don't necessarily want my kids to get <laughs> done when they're 20 years old or 20. Like, okay, that opens up their schedule as they're going through college to not have to take 17, 18 hours a semester. So, so that you hear it from me and from us is um, we try to provide those opportunities for students and keep that partnership alive as it develops every year with Metro um, so that kids have those opportunities. But all of that is based on what we have seen for them, for their career pathways, for when they leave here and what they, what they have been interested in. So one of the slides that Dr. Lewis had up here was, um, our career pathways. One of the things we don't just schedule haphazard and random. Um, so obviously we ask kids what do they want to be uh, participating in, what classes do they want to take, all of that kind of stuff. But then we track that and try to get as many career pathways for a student that would be um, uh, to equate to like a basic, a middle level, and then a capstone or a mastery class towards uh, a certain pathway in a career field. So we try to make our classes meet those pathways because we feel that those are sequential and beneficial for students and they're not just haphazard taking one health class here and then a, a social sciences class here and then a FCS class here and it's just all over the place. So. We're not against that. We just want, uh, if a student has those opportunities, we feel like we want to provide those for them. Okay, so students get a lot of opportunities. Um, they're required to have 260 credits to graduate. And so um, of those, they have to have four years of English plus speech, three years of social studies plus government, and then three years of math and three years of science. They have to have two years of PE classes and they have to have one year of fine arts. They have to have one year of computer classes. So the rest of those can be made up of all of these different opportunities. Some of them could be kickstart. Some of them could be um, taking, uh, you know, intro to woods and then taking woods one and two, which would be one of those pathways that we're talking about or a couple of different courses in welding. If you have students like kids like mine and they're not quite sure what they want to do, they might be taking drafting this semester and then they're going to take welding and then maybe they're going to take foods because not every kid knows you know not every kid knows exactly what they what they want to do so it's also great for them to be able to explore the different um, career fields before they get out there before they have to make a decision like oh, I'm going to major in so uh, I think we do a really good job giving them a wide variety of courses and I'm one of those fortunate people who's uh, my my son didn't have that opportunity because he graduated before we, we moved here, but my daughter um, is just, she should be technically by credits considered a junior when she's done with her freshman year. She got to take so many credits while she was here. So it really kind of freed up her schedule to dive into her major classes that she thought she wanted to major in and then discover almost immediately she didn't want to major in that. So she changed her major after one semester instead of a semester and a half or a year and a half like my son did. So um, it's just been a good opportunity for them to, to really dive in and, and kind of get to know themselves a little bit a little bit sooner, and like like Aaron said, we don't all want them to grow up that quickly. But it's nice to give them to exp the exposure to a lot of different things um, through these things. Um, one thing we didn't talk about too much on the previous slide were the activities that are connected with that. So we do have FFA, which is the Ag activities, and there's lots of different things. It's not just all about plant science or range judging. There's a lot of things that can get you know opportunities in an FFA. FBLA is similar. Lots of different things that um, that they can participate in in FBLA and then Skills USA. 
So between those, FFA has 61 students involved, and that's 7 through 12. FBLA has um, 100 students involved, and that's 7 through 12. And Skills USA is for high school students, um, and they have about 18 students that participated in that last year. But all in all, we have 32 clubs or athletics and activities that students can participate in. Mr. Shea, did you have the percentage of how many students participate in at least one extra activity? Did you know that one? Okay. There'll be a quiz later for you, Mr. Shada. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, and then we come to our guidance on mental health uh, curriculum and interventions. Um, so the elementary um, uses the American School Counselors Association standards for curriculum. The elementary students receive guidance lessons in their classrooms weekly. The sixth grade are piloting a program called Life Skills, um, which is all about decision making. Um, we, we um, this, uh, I'm sorry, unidentified strengths, it's all up there. K through six totally use what they call the toolbox. Um, and they can choose to use different tools to work themselves through other situations. Um, they can put the tool back in the box if they don't need that one, and they can pull out a different tool if they're experiencing a different situation. So Mrs. Fetty has done a wonderful job this year getting guidance into everyone. She also does uh, lunch groups. She, she pulls kids occasionally and says, hey, we haven't talked for a while. Why don't you come and have lunch with me? Uh, um, individual, some, she does some individual counseling with some students that that need um, a little bit of extra attention that she's developed a nice relationship with. Um, and then small group talks. Some of their topics are friendships, uh, bullying, relationships in general, situations that they have in common, things that they're struggling with. 7 through 12, I think we know guidance looks a little bit different, but we have different mental health avenues to help students in there. So we kind of shift more into that kind of career development piece in 7 through 12, where we start talking about what interests you and what do you think you would like to take um, to, to learn more about your particular interest to see if you want to turn that into um, a career. Um, so they use Education Quest's College Prep, Exploring College, Know How to Go, and uh, John Baylor Test Prep. So test prep is a big part of what we do, whether you're going on to a two-year, four-year or career well, upon graduation, everybody still has to uh, take that test prep and get ready for the ACT because that is a statewide and national measure of how well all, all of our schools are doing. Um, so that's what Mrs. Toft uses. She also finds time to meet with all of the juniors and seniors um, individually and kind of talk to them about their career pathways. Seniors in particular, she spends a lot of time counseling them through their their application process or their career development process. Where, where are you looking at next year? Are you if you if you want to go straight to the workforce, what interests you most? How can you start getting your foot in the door and make some connections with people in that way? So she works really hard to make sure that she has good relationships with all of the students and she makes sure that she finds opportunities for all of them, scholarship opportunities as well. Um, we also have two licensed mental health professionals that students can see in our facility. Um, they're both, uh, no, one of them is grant funded um, through ESU 3, that's through behavioral health um, grant. So we have a full-time counselor two days a week, a week. That's kind of the wrong way to say that. We have a part-time counselor who is here two full days a week. And so she's got a full caseload of students that she sees. Um, they have to go through kind of a screening process to be referred to her. We have tier one, two, and three interventions, just like we do for academics, to get them into um, see her as a counselor. She doesn't see students that are seeing outside counselors. So if your family has um, counseling lined up either for your entire family or for your student, um, we continue on with those outside ones. She develops relationships with the ones that don't have those resources. Um, and then we also have Arbor Family, who is available to all of our families, all of our staff, all of our students. So if you're not aware, Arbor Family Counseling, we've had a contract with them for several years. So if your family is going through a situation, you're in some type of crisis, or your student is having a hard time, you can reach out to Arbor Family, tell them that you're with the Arlington Schools Group, and you get three free counseling sessions for issues. So let's say your son's dog dies, and he needs some counseling because he's really struggling. He can see that counseling for three times to help him through that, but then later on grandpa dies, that's a new occurrence. So he gets three free sessions with that as well. So it's really a great resource. If you haven't used that and you think you could, please reach out. Also, if you know families that are struggling, um, direct them to our, both of our guidance counselors or our secretaries or anyone can help you get contact information 
and get an appointment set up with Arbor Family Counseling. Okay, everybody doing okay? I'm going a little bit over, but not too bad. So we'll take a break after this, I promise. We'll just kind of get through the last topic that everyone wanted to hear the most about, which is enrollment trends. So the 2020 census was finally released in 2022. So I got to dive into that a little bit, and I did some comparisons between 2010 and 2020 about some key statistics. So general population we're talking about in the 68002 population, has grown by about 400 people. The village of Arlington itself, according to 2010, compared to 2020, um, the population grew from 1487 to 1657. The um, rural population grew from 579 residents to 818 residents. The median age um, in 2010 was 40.3, and the median age in 2020, with the statistics they rolled out, was 37.1. So the population is getting slightly younger overall, um, which indicates, you know, um, really more young children in the area, which we see as well, because our school age population, which is 18, between the ages of five and 18, um, went from 639 to 661. So all of those populations growing in the area a little bit. If you go onto that website, it's kind of a beast. It's hard to, to dive into there. You've got to really narrow things down specifically, but it can be done. Um, the next slide that I put up, and I don't want to mislead anyone, we don't have 815 students in school, but this is a school census report that we have to prepare and submit every year, and what we have to do is all of the children in our school district that are between the ages of 5 and 18, we have to report, so that's separated out by counties. So we're looking at each age group in Washington County, each age group that live in Dodge County, but is part of our district, and each age group or age, not even groups, in Douglas County that are part of our school district. So the total there, um, this last year when we submitted was 815. Now keep in mind that um, if students are homeschooled, they're still part of this report that we have to submit. If students attend um, St. Paul or go out of district to another private school, we still have to submit them on this. If students option into another district, we submit them on this. Um, the students that have opted into Arlington's district appear on somebody else's census report. So. Um, the reason I show this to you is because there is one lump sum payment that we get from the state that's called state apportionment every year, and it's based on this, which is actually the amount of students that live, the amount of school age children that live in your district. So last year that amount was 86,741. They haven't told us what that will be this year yet. It's usually around February where they let us know um, what that amount is going to be. This is our current enrollment. And this is as of like three days ago, but it kind of changes a little bit. We get students. We've got a few students who have moved in since Christmas even, so, um, but this should reflect that. So in preschool, we have 27, kindergarten, 44, first grade, 48, um, and you can read all of those. Our total enrollment is currently 703 students. Um, St. Paul's School, which we coordinate on some things. Some of their students come to us for activities. Some of them come up and join us for music or for band, um, programs that they might not have available out there. We've got one that comes in and participates in a junior high ag class. Um, they have 80 students enrolled at St. Paul's. 22 of them are in pre-K. So some of those will become our students in kindergarten, and some of them will remain out there for kindergarten. Um, so that's kind of rolled into um, some of our figures when we're looking at numbers and projecting into the future, especially when we start looking at seventh and eighth grade. Our net option positive figure was 86 um, on October 1st, 2022, which is the date on which they base next year's option funding. So whatever magic dollar amount that they come up with this year, like I said, was 10,625. Next year, it'll be a little bit different than that. will be based on 86 students. So that's how they determine our option funding um, and for example, this year it was 998760 so that was a significant amount of our state funding. Um, we're not exactly sure what that will be next year, but that was based on, I think, 92 students last year, so we know it will be a little bit less. Okay, um, we've got a couple of policies that help us determine um, which option applications, how many applica option applications we can approve, and how many sections that we have. 
So in the essence of time, if you would like to see those, come and talk to me afterwards and I'll pull them up and you can look at them or I will email you copies of those. I do have them readily available here though, so if you'd like to see them. So every year in March, the board um, reviews our, our option resolution, which says this is capacity for this grade, this is capacity for this grade, and it goes all the way through. It's a section size limitation in elementary, so everything K through six is a section size limitation, and seven through 12, it's, uh, seven, it's, it's 58 students in seventh and eighth grade. We won't take any more option students over 58, and like for example, this year we have 65 seventh graders, something like that, so we did not take any option applications all for seventh grade. I think we took like two in eighth grade because we had 56 students and our limit was 58. So we definitely have uh, mechanisms in place to ensure that we don't overfill our classrooms with option students. We also um, probably, it's been at least three years already, we have this elementary policy that tells us um, how big class sections um, can get before we split into a third section because we don't want um, classrooms that have 27, 28, 29 students in them. So we have a policy that says when kindergarten and first grade um, exceed a size of 20 students per section, it was 22 students per section, we split those and do a third section. We have um, those for all of our grade levels in K through six. And then only after we have done that with the existing population, with what we're looking at for next year, do we then go back and say, okay, we have two sections of this class and each one of them have 19 students, so we cannot allow any options. Or we have three sections of this class and they all have 18, but we can allow up to 20, so we can take two, sec you know, two option students in each section if we get that many applications. So that's kind of how those, pro those policies work in tandem, so we definitely have controls in place to make sure that uh, we are not um, overfilling our classrooms and overburdening our teachers. All right, Matt, do you want to say anything? This is kind of our break point. Yeah, if anybody wants to. Um, that's what we had prepared, and, and we thought we'd take a little break here. I don't know. Does anybody need to take a break? Um, so we'd roll into taking some questions. There's no cards there. Um, you know, if you don't want to use no cards, I apologize. We don't have a wireless mic to pass around, but we'll do our best. Um, yeah, yeah, that'll be fine. I don't see anybody getting up that really needs to take a break. Okay, we do? All right, let's take five minutes then. Thanks, everyone.
All right, I think we got everybody back in here and it's not getting any warmer outside. <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and start through these. So I've got a uh, first question here. It's really two questions, um, but they both apply to budget. Does the board see the same breakdown of the budget as the state sees? That's the first question. The, le the following question to that, is it broke down into detail to the board and to the state? Um, I would say that the board sees, wh what we saw up here, is it fair to say that was a summary? That was a summary. So we see by account what that budget looks like, uh, percentage changes year over year. Um, throughout the year, we're looking at percent expended as compared to the prior year before. Um, and as far as I know, as the budgets are submitted to the state, they're submitted in the same detail, right? Um, so the budget itself that we submit to the state is much less detailed. Um, there's fewer um, categories that they have us break it down in. So the spreadsheet that the finance committee sees is about 30 pages long as we're going through. The summary is pretty much what we use for the worksheet workshop to not be overwhelming. And then the state um, gets, they get the three years. So when we submit the budget document to the state, they get the actual audited figures from two years prior, their estimated figures from the previous year, and then what you're budgeting this year. But we don't go as in detail because the, the document doesn't requirement. However, then when we come in and do the audit, the audit is in that great detail that, um, that our budget, the big budget spreadsheet that I work off of and that the finance committee works off of, um, that contains all of the detail from the previous year. So they see the budgeted figures they see is, is not quite as detailed, but then in retrospect, when they go back and look at the previous year, they get all of the detail of every single code, like I work in when we're creating the big budget as in the form of the audit. So both the budget document and the audit gets submitted to the Department of Education and the Auditor of Public Accounts. Hopefully that answers your question. This is uh, kind of in the same arena. Where can a person get a copy of the school budget showing line items, meaning a breakdown of what the spending was on specific items year by year? Um, you know, everything we create is is for the public. So uh, I'm just going to take an arrow here and say, go to the superintendent's office and ask for it. You can also find it on the Department of Education website. Okay. You can also find it on the Department of Education website. Okay, um, but it, it's available. If you know, look for it there. Come into the office and ask for it. Anything that we create here is available to the public. So, um, you know, it's long. If you get it, make sure you have some time. I don't even know. If I, it's a mess of printout. I don't even. 
Yeah, I don't even print it out anymore because it's such a long, detailed document. But the audit is, or the AFR, which is available on the website. Yeah, the AFR. So you can go to the Department of Education website and you look at the financial and organizational services and you can look up either the budget that we've submitted or the previous year's AFR. So those are probably the easiest to read. Otherwise, um, annual financial reports. Yes. So. So you can come in here and you can ask me and I'll probably, those, I can help you find those documents because the big long spreadsheet that I use is really cumbersome. Okay, uh, this says, can all the comparison tables be put on the website for everyone to see? Um, probably, but which comparison tables, I guess, would be my follow-up. Um, the whole slideshow, is that what we're looking for? Um, I don't see any reason why I can't. Send me an email of what you would like to see. Yeah. Go ahead and send me an email of what you would like to see. And um, yeah, I mean, we can we can probably put this slideshow on the website and we can also, I can email you whatever you want to see as well. So it's just don.lewis at apseagles.org and I will reply with whatever information you're requesting from this presentation. So. The next question here is how did we move back to equalization and what changed? Okay, so we move back into equalization when our yield from local effort rate, so that's the money they say we can generate by taxing as the TOSA formula tells us that we have to tax right now, which is 96% of, of um, real property and 72% of ag property. When that number exceeds or does not exceed what they say our formula needs are. So the formula resources, which is your yield from local effort rate and all those other little pieces in there that aren't considered state aid, when that number is less than what they say you need to operate, that's when you move back into equalization aid. Okay. All right. Um, have we ever explored having a family, career, and community leaders of America group? Um, I think you're referring to FCCLA, right? Okay, thank you. That's what that meant in my head. So um, at this point in time, I think we have, I think I've questioned a couple of times, but I don't know that right now we have enough students to do all of those things, but it's definitely, I mean, other schools that I've worked in in the past have had that. And usually what I saw is we had a really super strong program in one and one that was a little bit weaker and then maybe that one that wasn't, doing so great. So here we've got those super strong FBLA and FFA is really gaining strength and we've got Skills USA. So adding a fourth one in there, we could absolutely consider it, but you don't want to spread your students so thin that other programs, you know, begin suffering. However, we might be at a good point since so many students seem to be, you know, active in those non-athletic events that I mean, it might be um, that, that it might be the prime time to to look at something like that. But since I've been here, we haven't had a serious conversation about it. Other than, do we have FCS? Do we have FCCLA? And um, the answer is not right now. We haven't. I don't know, guys. Do you remember if there ever had FCCLA in the past? So, Mr. Shada is the veteran admin on the team. Uh, being here, what this is your eleventh year or your tenth year? 11th year, so he's been here longer than any of us, and he does not recall FCCLA. Mrs. Shelley, Mrs. Miller, nope, never had FCCLA. So. Yeah, they have a lot of opportunities in some of those others. So I know some of the FCCLA events kind of mirror what they might be able to do with a speech or a presentation in FBLA or um, with preparing a speech or doing something like that, some sort of a demonstration in FFA. And so a lot of them are similar in nature. So just like Mr. Sh Mr. Shada said in Skills USA, they can participate in culinary arts and some of those other things. In that 
activities we already have, that they can pursue that avenue within those skills so I would say those leaders are, I mean, Mrs. Agler is our FFA coach and Mrs. Coger is our FBLA coach. And then Mr. Hart and Mr. Bren work together on, on Skills USA. So if you have um, a student, if one of the kids who live in your house is interested in trying something different, talk to one of those and hopefully they have a similar um, activity that we can incorporate into them so they're getting the same type of opportunity just through a different organization than FCCLA. Okay, so a couple of these, um, the, here's a topic that's tied together, so they're coming off two cards, so bear with me. I'm going to jump around if one of these is yours. Um, what is the cost per pupil at Arlington compared to St. Paul, Bergen, and Faith Lutheran? Okay, and then this other card says, what is your yearly cost per student? Sort of the same question. I'm not sure how well we can pin them down. Um, I, uh, this is, typically I know this, but for some reason I haven't memorized that figure this year, but our cost per pupil is roughly around that $12,000 figure. It's been down closer to 11 before, it's been up higher to as, as high as 13 before, but typically it's between, um, I would say 11 and $13,000 per pupil. The statewide average, when you uh, uh, factor in all the students that go to the urban schools and all the students that go to the rural schools, um, um, I believe it's probably between ten and eleven thousand dollars. So a little higher, but if you go out west and you've got a school district that only has eighty-eight students K through twelve, they're spending like twenty-six thousand dollars per student. So you have to really kind of balance and weigh that out. The state does not um, calculate per pupil costs of private schools, so I have no way of knowing that because um, they don't get state funds and they don't calculate their per pupil. Um, cost to educate a student. And another thing to mention is that um, the private schools don't have to offer, they're not required to offer some of the expensive programs that we are required to have. So they don't, unless they're an accredited private school, which a lot of them are approved, which there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a different level of accreditation. Um, they contract with the public schools for like their special education costs, which is some of the most expensive costs. So we pay for those. <laughs> So like their per pupil, per pupil cost would look significantly different because the public school is incurring the cost of, of educating them with their special education needs. They don't have to have the same offerings. They don't have to have the same amount of, they might have to have um, the same well, an amount of credits required for graduation if they're a high school, but they don't have to have, they're not bound by rule 10 to the same required offerings as we are. So there's really no way for me to tell you um, what any of the private or parochial schools cost to educate a student. Thank you. Uh, this is a two part question. What efforts are being made to decrease utility costs and what is being done to avoid being a victim of ransomware. So we've got utility cost and tech here. Okay. So uh, utility costs, uh, the best that, the, the smartest things that we've done in the past few years is like if you take a, don't look because they're really, really bright, but the LED lights were changing out. I was gonna say look overhead, but don't It'll burn your eyes. Um, but the LED lights are much more efficient. Um, the cost has come down those on on those a lot. They, they cost a lot less to to um, per kilowatt hour to to run. We get a lot more light for for less electricity. So switching out to LED lights, um, uh, our new addition was very 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 well insulated and things like that to keep the costs down. Um, the heating units, the new windows that we replaced, um, they are designed. They don't open, which is designed to use your HVAC systems to its maximum potential and it's supposed to be cheaper to run because you don't have, they draw in their own outside air and, and heat their own air, so you don't have windows that open. Um, they're triple pane, so they're quite a bit more efficient. Uh, those are the, the things that are jumping out at me the most. Um, what was the other part of that question? Uh, what are we doing? Oh, ransomware, right? Prevent being a of ransomware. Okay. So our our network um, is through uh, ESU3, our internet network. So they have, um, we have backup off-site at ESU3. We have on-site backup as well. So um, if anything would happen, we can always just 
go back to a previous backup. We haven't had um, ransomware attacks. Um, some of those things that we're talking about doing um, are moving to multi-factor authentication, which I'm sure a lot of you are aware. If you're trying to log into your bank account or a credit card or just about anything, if you're, I don't know, there was a really weird one the other day. I can't remember what it was. It was like, I don't know, Amazon or something like that, where it made me log in with two-factor authentication, which I would not have expected. So a lot of them are moving towards that. What we've been doing is a lot of research because um, Alleycap is our insurer. They said, right now you do have cybersecurity protection, but you don't, we would not have ransomware. And they look at that two different ways. However, they said what schools um, have kind of started doing is kind of the boat that we're in saying, Okay, hacker. Well, we don't have ransomware coverage because they they won't cover us if you don't have um, certain things in place. And the list is about 30 pages long that Mr. Larson and I had to go through um, to attempt to even begin it in like a school of size. It's just not possible to put a lot of the measures in place. But what a lot of schools are doing is um, is making the decision to say. Okay, you say you have that data, but you, you don't have us by the throat because we have our backups. So we can reset back to the backup and corrupt whatever file that they think they have. But um, to combat that, we also have um, GoGuardian, which um, nightly does a sweep and it tells us in the morning, which doesn't happen frequently, but it tells us in the morning what IP addresses are trying to access our network at what point in time during the day or if it's overnight. They can say uh, three different IP addresses attempted to um, access your server at 3 a.m. So we can get reports like that um, on a regular basis. Right now, that is coming to us um, at no cost from ESU3 because they wanted a smaller school. And ESU3 is a lot of the metro schools and a lot of schools that are larger than we are. So they wanted to pilot that in a smaller school to see how well it worked. So we're getting that service for free right now. So we have those, those regular scans and reports that we get. Um, and we will probably, more than likely, you heard it here first, staff, be moving to at least two-factor authentication on staff computers next year, which they said will qualify us for an additional level of coverage. It's a problem for everybody. Um, here's a quick one. How are board committees established and who determines who is on each committee? Um, our policy says that after the organizational meeting, uh, which occurs in January, that the board president assigns the committees. Um, so the policy is pretty straightforward on that. Since facilities were not part of tonight's presentation, what is the current plan for continued renovation of older spaces? I thought we had all the older spaces done. Hmm, what about the room that we're in right now? Uh, go ahead, I'll, I'll let you cover this. So we kind of talked about this just a little bit in our buildings and grounds meeting where we talked about how we meet, the buildings and grounds will meet in the next month or two here and we'll start looking at facilities that need like need to be addressed, like issues that need to be addressed in the next year, the next three to five years, and maybe in the next 10 years. The admin team and I have conversations about that too. So we know that there are certain things that come with regular maintenance that we're going to need to address in the next couple of years. And we talk about those in those, and we, we talk about um, where, where we would levy, where we would uh, move money into depreciation to take care of those kinds of costs and things like that. Um, you know, you would think that maybe this room would be one of them, but this floor is pretty durable. I hate to take this thing up because, um, I mean, I think it's outlasted just about every every other room in here. So, um, and if we replace it, we're gonna have to replace it with a blue floor because it's the blue gym. I got, I got made fun of one time for calling it the cafeteria and they're like, what do you mean the cafeteria? I'm like, the room where everybody eats? That's the blue gym, it's not the cafeteria. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's a few other things. We know that the track will need regular maintenance. Um, we desire to maybe do some some upgrades out there. Um, the gym floor will need a little bit more than just like a surface coat. It will need some regular maintenance and things like that. So we have an ongoing summative needs list that we look at um, on an annual basis. And we try and move things off that list that we can easily take care of and then plan for the future of the, uh, the ones that require a little bit more attention and a little bit more money. You know, I, I would just add, uh, Bruce Shears here tonight, and I thought Bruce did an excellent job of talking when he had his short retirement speech. It's short. 
um, about all the things we've done since he was on the board in six years. And uh, it really made me stop and think a little bit about uh, what we've done with some of our older facilities, because we know that there's parts of this building that are pretty dang old um, and we're knocking away on them and, and I don't think there's any appetite to stop that. We're going to continue to identify areas and try and improve them. Matt, Bruce was on for eight years. He wants the record to show. Okay. Bruce was on for eight years. We, it seemed like 18 to some of us. <laughs> okay. Um, curriculum. This is, this is a great comment. Whoever sent this up here, thank you. Uh, happy to see course on handwriting since so much is done via keyboard, cell phones, etc., computers. Okay, and here's a question. This might be one for Mr. Fingston. On career paths through Metro Tech, is there a certain class level to participate? And are Metro classes online? And how much? How do students attend? How do students what? How do students attend? Yeah, the Kickstarter classes. Can everybody hear him? Because I can, I can drag the microphone. It might be prerequisite courses. Like some of the like college English. Clearly, they have to. Can I see the see the card? Yeah. It's the bottom question. Okay. Yeah. Certain class levels that um, students need to participate. Um, the answer to that is yes, it depends on what class it is. I'll give the example of uh, Spanish. So we offer Spanish concurrent enrolled. So that means that our teacher here is able to teach our kids here and they get credit for uh, elementary Spanish and then second year uh, uh, intermediate Spanish. Well, they have to take Spanish one first and Spanish two first, and then they can enroll in our Spanish three, which is elementary Spanish at the college level. Then they can take element, or excuse me, our Spanish four, which is intermediate Spanish at the college level. So that's an example of us having the teacher here at school um, and able to teach our classes with Metro's classes and then them having prerequisites of Spanish one and two to be able to be enrolled in those classes. So there are certain, depends on what class it is, depends on what curriculum it is. Um, as far as just general overall, I don't, I can't quote if you have to be 16 to be in, I, I honestly don't know. Uh, Metro has some career academies that we've had students participate in. Um, we have some where it's an issue as far as scheduling goes um, to be able to allow for our students to be able to participate in those because they do have to meet our graduation requirements. Um, but we always work with students and families who if a student has an interest in something, then we want them to be able to participate in those career academies or different things that way. Uh, one thing I forgot to say earlier is if you are, uh, you have students maybe in high school, maybe you realize this or know this, but maybe if you have students in upper elementary or middle school, um, at least until 2025, Metro classes, the fee, excuse me, the tuition for those because of how they use some federal funding is free. So for our kids, those classes are free outside of textbook costs and maybe like a lab fee type of thing. So that's another benefit to families is even uh, where before that we had, it was a reduced cost. I forget what it was, something like $48 maybe total, maybe it was a credit hour. So that's gone. So that helps out families a lot as well. That helps out um, your uh, everything from your well-to-do to, -do to uh, students who would qualify for free, reduced lunches, different things like that. So it's an opportunity cost um, that the gap that is trying to be uh, mitigated by the way they're using those funds. So um, there's a couple different things about Metro. So the answer is Yes and no. There's some of them are online. Some of them are taught here face to face. Um, and I, we have students as young as sophomores that are enrolled in some of those dual credit kickstart things, don't we, Shelley? Right Mrs. Miller. Is good. Yeah. Online independent study. We don't have a teacher other than giving them a class period and some guidance. 
what we do though is we try to provide the time in their schedule to take the class mm -hmm. while they're with us so that we the truth is you have a little bit more control over that and then we're able to kind of be able to track their progress a little bit better than if it's just you're doing that on your own it counts for high school credit and college credit but we don't really provide you the opportunity or the time in the day to take it we now also metro has a career navigator that comes here once a week who helps us track the progress of the students that we have who are taking those classes so it is a really good partnership and i want you to hear that um, like our goals with this are, are providing opportunities with kids not forcing them to mm -hmm. go to Metro or take the, uh, if their post-secondary plans look different, we have different options as well that we do some school to work opportunities for students so that they can go uh, part of the day and go work in a, and we try to connect them with uh, businesses that would meet their uh, career pathways that maybe aren't a post-secondary go to college even if it's an right. associate's degree pathway. Yep. We're not not everything is super solid as far as yeah that's my career pathway and i'm able to connect you with that uh, local business but boy if you have a local business and you would be interested in that we're always looking for partnerships with local businesses that maybe our kids go to those pathways and that's really where they see their career Okay, and as I'm turning this over to Shelly, because she's the secretary in the guidance, and she has lots of answers, but I want to throw in there too, we also work with um, the branches of the military for recruiters for students who have their sights on a military career as well. In order for a student to take any of the Kickstart classes through Metro, they have to have a GPA of 3.8, 3.0 or higher. Most cases, the kids have to be about 17 years old, but they will waive that for 16 year olds if their GPA will meet the requirement. Some of your English and math have a, an ACT requirement score that they have to have before they'll allow them in the classes. Thank you. I'm so glad that you were there to answer that for us. Okay. Um, thanks, guys. Shelly, thank you. Um, this one, I don't know if we've got a clear answer to this, but we're, we're going we're gonna to take it anyway. What adjustments, if any, will need to be made if the bill passed to allow kids to go to private schools and have tax dollars follow them, what adjustments would we need to make as a public school? Um, lots, how's that for an answer? Or maybe none, depending on who leaves. Um, I, you probably understand that better than me. Do you wanna speak to it? So there's a couple of bills. The, the primary one that would be, um, the, the one that you would consider to be the easiest avenue for students to get um, public funds to attend a private school, which for a lot of the reasons that we just talked about, like like the, the public school, school would still be required to educate their SPED students and things like that. So it's problematic in some ways and they don't have to have the same programs and they wouldn't be obligated to the same state reporting and things like that, that we are. But, um, so the bill would essentially, would look at the per pupil cost, the average per pupil cost in the state of Nebraska. And that's that figure I talked about that we're slightly over, but some districts are way over and some are a little bit under. Then they would take half of that amount or 55% of that amount or something like that and establish an account for every student who is currently enrolled in a parochial school and they could access those funds to pay for a whole list of things that we could not spend public funds on so those are some of the reasons why that's problematic because some of the things listed are like required uniforms that they have to wear to school and tutors private tutors and things like that so it was it was not just for tuition it was for I mean, a lot of supplemental things. So what would we have to do? I mean, I don't know. We may have, I don't know, we may have some uh, families that would, that are only here because they can't afford the tuition. But I do know that a lot of private schools um, do offer scholarships for families that want to attend, but can't, can't afford the tuition. And there are, there are um, you know, there are benefactors and donors that kind of make that happen at some of those schools already. So hopefully we wouldn't see an awful lot of changes to our student population. But I mean, I guess, uh, I mean, there's there's definitely private school options around us. I don't know um, what I can see might happen for uh, 
in a private school setting, if I was, you know, a principal at a private school and I was running them, I might say, oh, well, I guess we don't have to offer you a scholarship because now you have, you know, $6,000 to access. So we know you can afford at least $6,000. So we're going to drop that off of your scholarship or whatnot. So one way or another, you know, honestly, I'm sorry. I don't, uh, I guess I'm not in a good frame of mind about that bill right now. Would we change anything that we're doing? No, because we're meeting state requirements above and beyond. We're offering great opportunities for our students. We hope that what Arlington Public Schools is offering is attractive because, I mean, we already have. Um, would it maybe change the mind um, of a few students that are coming to us because they prefer not to be in their home district and they've tried to option it? Perhaps because maybe they would look at the private school who they thought they couldn't afford as, as an option now where it wasn't an option before. So maybe... The biggest impact I can see is it would be would be maybe on the amount of option applications we receive, which is which has really been pretty minimal in the past few years anyway. We don't we don't receive a significant amount of those, but I don't know if I really answered that question or not. I just think that we have a great product here, we have great teachers, we have a great system. So would we change anything because we're scared of public funds going to to private schools. I would oppose that for all of the reasons I said, but I don't think we would change anything we do because we have a great school. Thanks. So there's a couple here uh, about transportation. The first one, actually I'm gonna reverse them, whoever sent this card up here. What is the cost per mile for transportation? I can't tell you what that number is off the top of my head, but every year the board gets a transportation report. Does that, that seems like that occurs in the summer? Is that a July item? So, little piece of trivia for everybody. You can go to, is it um, spark.meeting? Uh, what is that website? It's our agenda, so I think it's either June or July or August. I'm pretty sure it's yeah. July. If you go back to the, um, to the board agenda, from the July meeting, you should be able to find the transportation report that gets approved. Yeah. And on that, if, you have that, that figure broken down. Yeah, if, if there's anything you wanna see, so everything that's in a board meeting is saved in perpetuity, you can uh, Google Spark School meetings and find the website, look up Arlington, you can log in, you can go back, geez, I think you can go back 10 years, even further. We archive a lot of that stuff, so any of the documents created, any of the agendas, whether it's budget, the number you're looking for there with uh, cost per pupil, it's all in there. Um, I'm making notes as we go through this. Um, I can find that number. I can go back and do that. It'll just be a matter of how we get it communicated to you. Um, the follow-up to that question is, what is the cost per option student for transportation? And um, I, I think, you know, we just have to look at a... Uh, Miles on the bus times the you know I, it's. You want to take this? It might be tough. Um, I mean the cost per pupil. Uh, the majority of the students that we are um, transporting, and if if this is referencing the route that goes to Fremont, um, are students that um, would be eligible that are eligible for free and reduced lunches, and therefore we're obligated to transport them. Um, we don't calculate a per pupil cost of what transportation costs. We just have our overall transportation costs. So we run four routes. Uh, and going outside of the district boundaries on that one for those students um, is required of us because of the requirement that if your option students are uh, free and reduced students, they're eligible for school transportation and you need to pick them up. So we haven't ever done the figure on that, but it really takes us outside of our school boundary by about two miles and then back. So I would say four or eight miles a day. Um, but that's, and you would break that down by, I don't know, depending on the day, 30, 40 kids um, get on the bus at that stop, sometimes less and sometimes more, and that varies by day. So it's really a difficult number to calculate out, but just know that the ones that we're transporting were required to transport. 
Anita. Go ahead, Pete. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This question is, why do we have more days of school than other districts? Extra days add uh, more expense. So we work um, on a lot of different things when we negotiate um, contracts with the certificated staff. And among those are the average days of a contract and the average days in session. So I can tell you we are within one day of the average. So we don't have more days in school than um, other districts um, that are in our array. I can't tell you, I mean, I know um, my husband works for the ESU school and they're in school 192 days. Our teachers have a contract of 186 days. Um, we have a board policy that says we have to have at least 178 student days. We're required to have 1,080 hours of instruction annually at the high school level, um, 1,040 at the middle school level, and 1,032 at the elementary level. So it's a, the magic number of meeting all of those requirements. And then um, the staff negotiate with the board for the days on the contract as well. And it's been 186 days for a long, long time. I think um, there's some in our array that have 187 days. There's some that have 185. There might be like one with 184, but we do not have a significantly different amount of days than other school districts that um, are within our array, which means we compare with them size-wise, staff-wise, student-wise, that type of thing. My, uh, my kids, they don't buy that either. I, I tell them the same thing that we're just like, all their friends where they go to school, we have the same number of days. Um, so we've been through all of our questions tonight, and I, I want to go back and just thank everybody for being here. I know it's cold outside, and this isn't the most exciting thing, but it's good to see some interest in what we're doing up here, um, where our kids are going. Um, you know, thanks to Don, to Dr. Lewis here for putting this together. I was uh, I kind of joking with her earlier today and when she was updating me on how this was coming. And I said, you know, this is kind of funny. The board says, hey, let's have a community engagement meeting. This will be fun. Well, she has to do all the work to get ready for it. So we, we appreciate it, yeah. And uh, just, you know, one other thing, all six of us board members, if, if you go to the website and look at, uh, there's a button on there for school board or board or whatever, there's a link there with all of our email addresses. And I, I don't know about the other five. I, I think I can tell you that everybody checks that email pretty regularly. I look at it multiple times a day. So we as a board, you know, one of the reasons why we're here is we want to let everybody know that we're accessible. You know, if you're a parent, if you're a community member, whatever, we're accessible to you. Um, you can, most of you have our phone numbers. You can call us or know somebody that does um, or link there on the email. Don's email is on there also, the email to all the, all the offices really. Yeah. Actually all your teachers, all of your, everybody, Yeah, so that's a, that's a great place to start. Um, so hopefully you learned something tonight that you didn't know about our school and what we're doing up here. That was really my goal for this evening. Um, I can tell you, even as a board member for as long as I've been on, I, I look at a presentation like this and go, A, I didn't know we were doing that or I forgot that. So I think that highlights why it's important for us to get up in front here and, and let everybody know what's going on. Um, because we've, we've got a really neat place up here and we've got a lot of great people, a lot of good things going on. And uh, as a community, we should be really proud of it. So it's, it's, it's a great place. Do you have anything else that you'd like to add? Yeah. Yeah, and I just want to thank everybody for coming, but I hope that um, what you're getting from us is, especially uh, the three people back there, and the teachers that are sitting in the back, how passionate we are about what we do. Um, we love these kids. We want these programs to be strong. We want our kids to be successful, whether they're in kindergarten or whether they're a senior, whether they're in the life skills program, whether they're in a vocational program, whether they're going to college, or sometimes we only get them for a couple of months. We work our tails off to give them everything that they need to be successful while they're here with us and then beyond. So I hope that that's coming through tonight. And uh, I'm, I'm really glad somebody picked up on the handwriting in third grade. That's really a fun thing. But we just appreciate you coming and being involved in this. Uh, we intend to continue this on an annual basis. This became this came out of board our board, board retreat, working on our goals last year. So.
Thanks again. And just know that, uh, you know, we don't always make the perfect decisions or the perfect choices, just like kids, but our heart is always in the right place. And we want to do what's best for every single kid that's sitting in our classrooms. Thanks, everyone. Stay warm.